Okay, so let's talk about talent again. Now, in the context of somebody like Bob Dylan, let's take Bob Dylan for an example. Now, I don't know if you're a fan of Bob Dylan, but Bob Dylan is easily one of the, or, or Bob Dylan is one of the best songwriters in American musical history. Okay? And if he's not the best songwriter in American musical history, he is easily, easily the best lyricist. Easily, by far, hands down. Nobody else is even close. Bob Dylan has like hundreds of great lyrics to everybody else's like five or ten. You know, there are cool lyricists in pop music. Uh, the Rolling Stones have some great lyrics. Beatles, Clash. You know where I taste go, Johnny Rotten. <laughs> uh, actually, Morrissey has some really cool lyrics. Um, Paul Westerberger, underrated, great lyricist. Honestly, Paul Westerberger. Check it out if you don't know him. Um, the Replacements. Grab your favorite lampshade. Somewhere there's a party. Here it's never ending. Can't remember when it started. Bring your old lampshade. They'll be clearing out a room in jail. If being strong, being strong's your, if being wrong's your kind, I'm serving forever. If being strong's your kind, then I need help here with this feather. If being afraid is a crime, we hang side by side. At the swinging party down the line. Yeah, I garbled that a little. I don't know what I got. I got, I got distracted. I garbled it a little. Being afraid is a crime. We hang side by side. At the swinging party down the line. It's about alcoholism. It's a really, really great song. He's got other lyrics. God, what a mess. On the ladder of success. Take one step and miss the whole first rung. Dreams unfulfilled, graduate unskilled, beats picking cotton and waiting to be forgotten. We are the sons of no one, bastards of young. -n 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 -n. That's a cool song, great lyrics. God, what a mess and the ladder of success. Take one step, miss the whole first rung. So, anywho, what is, what constitutes a great lyricist? Something, when, when you are reading a poet that we've called a great poet, it is someone who has stood the test of time. You are reading William Butler Yeats something like 150 years after he has actually written it. So what's happened? In a sense, it's been peer-reviewed. Somebody has read the poem and said, yes, that's really deep, profound, and significant, and they pass it up through time. And another person said, yeah, I agree, and I assent to that. And they, they, in a sense, it's been peer-reviewed. Now, what is the actual substance of the talent itself? Well, in terms of poetry, it is taking you, the reader, from their personal, subjective, specific experience. If they, see, what they are doing is they are writing something in, usually in the first person with poems, subjective, personal, specific experience. And in their talent, they are finding something universal, transcendent, deep and meaningful to somebody reading it 500 years after the fact. Or in the case of Yeats, 200 years after the fact. So Yeats finds a great line, like, um, uh, what's, a, what's a great line from Yeats? Um, 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 come on, hurry up. A uh, <laughs> great line from Yeats, like, uh, my, soul, my, soul, so, my heart so weary and sick with grief and fastened to a dying animal. Now, that's a powerful line. And it also speaks of the metaphysical condition, or the existential condition, does it not? Does it not? Your heart is literally fastened to a dying animal. That's a really deep and significant line. So you read it 200 years after the fact. That line is famous. Why? Because you're reading it, you know, uh, you were reading it now and going, wow, that, that, Furthermore, it addresses some of the perennial questions. The perennial questions. Notice the choice of words. The underlying, most important, generally speaking, perennial question that almost all religions deal with. Why? Because it is the perennial. And almost all forms of great art and literature deal with is tick, 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 ticking away the moments that make up a dull day. Life is fleeting. In light of the temporal nature of life, 
Religion asks the question, how are we to build our house? How are we to construct our life? Construct our house here in the real world, here and now, in light of the fact that life is fleeting. Poets often address the same question. Let's take Bob Dylan, for example. He not busy being born is busy dying. Very famous Dylan line. Sounds almost like it comes out of the book of Ecclesiastes, does it not? If I told you that was a scripture, you would believe me. So, let's analyze exactly what is happening. A poet, for example, is taking a specific subject of experience, and in his talent, he is finding a way to make that generally relatable to a universal truth that, that is transcended in nature. So I, 500 years after the fact, can read it and go, hmm, that's really deep and significant to me. So let's take, like, for example, the poet Rumi. I don't know if you've heard of Rumi. He's uh, generally considered the best po poet of uh, Islam. He's a Middle Eastern poet. They call him the Shakespeare of the Middle East. Okay, so Rumi is, is in, you know, he's in the desert somewhere, unbuckling, his, <laughs> unbuckling the bags on his camel, and he's writing in a subjective, personal experience, trying to find something deep and meaningful and significant to himself in the experience. Oh, I unbuckled my cam I traversed the desert with my camel. As I unbuckle the belts, I see in the, in the night sky. You see what he's doing? He's grasping for metaphorical truths. He's searching the contents of his own heart and mind in context of the given situation. A specific, subjective situation that he is giving voice to. But, if he is a poet who has truly passed the test of time, if I, Craig, am reading that 600 years after the fact, in that expressive gift, he has tapped into something universally significant. What on earth do I care about camels? I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't know anything about camels. So generally speaking, he'll be, he'll be saying, you know, as I unbuckle my camels, my, my camel, I don't even know what you put on a camel. What do you put on a camel? As I, as, as, I, as I wash the hump of my camel, it occurs to me, lo, this desert is so dry as I've traversed these many years. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, I said he was a great poet, and I turned him into a doofus poet. Well, whatever. I didn't say I was a great poet. I said Rumi was a great poet. I'm just kind of making up what he's making up of his, whatever he's saying about camels. I don't know, something stupid. But point is, so why am I reading Rumi today? Somebody said to me, Craig, here, Rumi's a great poet. Why? He's really deep and significant, man. Check him out. What, what do you, and I say, why do I care about camels and, camels and deserts? So it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. There is a transcendent reality to what the person, the artist with the expressive gift, has found in their art. That is what we call talent. That is how we rank our artists. That is why we care about what they write and why we read what they write many years after the fact. It is really the only thing that makes an artist pass the test of time. Now we go back to Peterson's phrase that I heard in his debate. Oftentimes, a powerfully creative person will describe themselves as a conduit through which divine energy flows. Now, that specific idea of divine energy as a sort of vague energy, oftentimes, creative people will describe themselves that way as a sort of vague energy thing. That specific voice of God Vague, that vague idea of eternal. That voice of God, that is found everywhere in literature. That's what constitutes talent. That's what actually makes something pass the test of time. It's why you care about a piece of literature. It is the artist has moved from the specific has given voice to something in, in the specific. Let's say it's a literary artist, then he's used a character in time and space and the mechanics of a plot device to represent something generally true about the human condition. Otherwise, it's not great literature and you're not going to read it 200 years later. Things that just focus on the mechanics, we have a name for that, a genre. Sometimes genre things are fun. 
But it's not the same thing. It's not art in the same capital A sense of the word art. Why? Because it's not trying to point to anything metaphysically true. The metaphysical substrate that Peterson talks about that undergirds our religions, our stories, and our tales, if you will. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back to it in another video. That's all for now. Amen.